Okay. okay. Hi. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm not in, quite used to saying good morning at this seminar, but I'll get used to it uh, somehow. It's a pleasure to have here uh, Professor Helen Huang from uh, the Biomedical, the Joint Biomedical Engineering uh, Department, UN, NC State and UNC. Uh, Dr. Wong got a PhD from ASU, Arizona State University, and then subsequently she joined uh, the, uh, the Center for Bionic Medicine Rehabilitation uh, Institute uh, in Chicago. Uh, this is a Northwestern uh, Institute. Uh, she's currently an associate professor, as I just mentioned, in our uh, biomedical engineering department. She's also an, uh, an adjunct professor at UNC Department of Me Physical uh, Medicine and Rehabilitation. Her main uh, research interests are in the area of robotics, neural ma machine interface, and virtual re reality in physical rehabilitation, modeling and analysis of neural mu muscular control and movement, uh, basically name it, anything that has to do with the human body and uh, robotics. Uh, her research has been uh, well recognized and funded by uh, NSF, NIH, DOD, uh, DHHS, and uh, she's also been recognized with several awards, uh, including the NSF Career Award and the Mary Switzer Fellowship. Uh, she's uh, served as an associate editor of several IEEE transactions, including biomedical engineering uh, journal, and she's also a member of the Society of Neuroscience and Biomedical Engineering uh, Society. Uh, it's a pleasure to have her here talk to us about uh, some uh, uh, motor function or restoration of motor function in amputees with smart prosthetics and robotics. The floor is yours. <laughs> thank you for coming. Please turn off your cell phone. All right, thank you, Hamid. Uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, give a talk. I actually intend to, because of my background is actually, uh, you know, I got a PhD from biomedical engineering, but uh, my bachelor, my basic you know, uh, background is actually in uh, electrical. So what I do, uh, you know, a lot of the technique is related to signal processing and the control. So I thought that this is a great audience to uh, present my work. All right, so, um, so I want to first to just uh, giving an idea what I'm working on is the uh, bionic technology. So what does it mean is that like, you know, I'm not working on pure robots. Uh, you know, bipedal robots. Uh, so, and I am also, I do some of the work to study the human movement, um, but again, I'm not purely study like the human function. I work on kind of like a combination of a human and a machine. And then this combination, again, it's not a purely like the industrial uh, engineer, uh, industrial robots uh, interact with a human. This is a more like a wear device that will hook up embedded, uh, embodied into the human body and then try to be a uh, function, helping people <coughs> has a disability to, to enhance their physical abilities. So that's what I do. Uh, so therefore, I'm working on a very unique uh, area. So this is a very busy uh, slide that is basically introduced my lab. Uh, so my research focus will, uh, I, what I wanted to, you know, to create is a very innovative about uh, bionic technology that will provide a personalized, uh, effective, cost-effective, and also robust assistance for people, you know, with a disability to enhance their uh, physical ability uh, in, in, in their daily living. So what I'm working on is uh, the interactions uh, between the man and the machine through the neural interface. So basically, you know, how the, the human, since the machine is hooked up inside of the human body, um, then how do they communicate with each other? Because essentially, this is, will be part of their body, hopefully. Um, and then uh, I also work on a man and machine uh, co-adaptation. Uh, a lot of my algorithm is adaptive, smart, you know, uh, and then also human is smart. We always learn new tasks. Uh, when there's two kind of intelligent agents work together, can they coordinate with each other? Uh, can they really achieve uh, the goal that is supposed to enhance uh, the human ability? All right. Um, and I also work on, uh, you know, I, my, my passion about translating those technology 
into the clinic and into the industry uh, is also an emphasis of the, my lab. All right. Um, so I will start to uh, focus on, so, you know, within this context, uh, I want to say this talk, I will focus on prosthetics. Okay, so the prosthetics is a device that replace, uh, you know, certain body parts, you know, for people who lost a limb, amputees, they, uh, they have, uh, they, you know, they, their, their limb loss. So using the robotic approach to attach to their limb and then try to restore. So, and then, uh, so in clinic, uh, I'm putting the significance here is in the United States, uh, well, by 2005, the number reported is about 1.7 million people has a limb amputation. Uh, and also because, you know, the population uh, grow uh, and then also the age, uh, you know, the incidence of this vascular disease uh, increase as well. So the estimation of the population, this population will actually double uh, in about 40, no, actually 30 years. So uh, technology-wise, I want to just uh, bring you an idea how the current technology, if you go to a clinic, an amputee clinic, what you see is basically the prosthetic arm still looks like this, and then the leg, that's, you know, uh, very common, you, you know, device that is actually uh, most used in a, in a market. So they are difficult. So for example, the, the lower limb, Right, you can see this is not really like a walking. Uh, he is very worried about his uh, uh, stabilities, right? And then the speed was not there. And then for this per patient, he has, uh, you know, bilateral uh, shoulder disarticulation, so both arms are gone, to perform a very simple task from just picking up a block and then transfer to the other side. It's quite difficult task. It takes him a long time, energy to do it. So. I see the technology will uh, significantly, uh, you know, improve the quality of life for these people because, you know, the technology was just not satisfying. Um, so, you know, my, uh, I want to just uh, describe uh, you know, briefly uh, three areas that I'm working on. I'm trying to work on an uh, embodiment. Embodiment is like, say, you know, when you have the device attached to the body, Essentially, what you want to achieve is you feel this is your part of your body. So it's kind of like from the psychological point. Then in order to do that, you know, the communication between the man and the machine has to be there. Uh, so I'm working on the neural machine interface. And then efficiency, right? So the device is going to attach to the person's body, going to function every day. So, and then, you know, when you think about the number of tasks you're performing every day, um, so that, and also the environment that you encounter. So it's a lot, uh, and then it varies. But can the device, together with the human, together, can adapt to these situations? And then, so I'm going to talk about a kind of like smart tuning approach. And then the last one will be safety. So any device, it's not, if not safe, it will be abandoned quickly. So safety is essential. So. I will start from a neural control of a prosthetic, uh, actually start with ARP, okay? So uh, do you familiar with a muscle signal that you can pick up from your surface? Okay, so that's called the EMG. Uh, so for people use a prosthetic device like this, it's a hand, you know, just open or close. And then potentially they also have a wrist that can rotate, okay? And then uh, in order to drive that, so people use a residual muscle, okay? The residual muscles, a person lost the arm, hand, for example, there's still muscle that control the hand. You can use the muscle here to control the hand open or close. And then the control is very simple. Just a threshold, when the muscle signal is larger than a threshold and a certain specific muscle, then it will drive one direction. And then if you pick up another muscle, use a threshold, you can do another way, okay? The problem is, well, there are potentially not enough sites can generate independent control. So that's limitation of the control sites. So usually it's, they could only control one degree freedom for two, two muscles can control one degree freedom. Okay, if you will control more, that's difficult. Uh, so nowadays, you know, there's a machine learning approach. Uh, so people started to say, okay, 
if I can recognize the pattern on the arm. Uh, because, you know, when I open or close my hand, clearly my muscle contraction pattern is different. Can we just use matching this pattern to recognize different emotions? That way, then we can control a more degree freedom. And then it's actually more intuitive. Um, so this type of work just started to translate into the clinic. Well, I, I would say it's, there's a product just to come to the market. Uh, how well it performs, I will show you. Uh, you know, it's a problem missing, uh, but they definitely also have a limitations. Okay. And then I also got a question about what if, you know, the, we are meeting a patient that has a shoulder disarticulation, like the entire arm are gone. There are no muscle you can pick it up. The, I mean, the muscle that control the, the, the hand, it's already gone. So there's no sight you can do that. Uh, and then the work that I've done uh, at the Northwestern is uh, there's a surgeon that, uh, who could uh, generate a new way to restore that neural uh, signal. So the idea is, uh, let's say, you know, the person lost the arm, right, the muscle, the bone are all gone. But the nerve, right, the nerve is supposed to go into the arm and it's still dancing inside of the body. So they pick, the surgeon could pick those nerves and rewire to another piece of muscle and then let the nerve to grow. So when the person thinks, oh, I want to open the hand, then the chest muscle started to contract. So you can use that muscle to control the device. Okay, this is just showing after this patient goes through the surgery, we did a high density uh, muscle recording. So put a lot of electrodes on the this chest muscle, re-innervated muscle. And then when the person trying to imagine actually doing the, some motions, okay, abduction, adduction, and the wrist, wrist motion, you can clearly see the different activation pattern in the muscle. So again, if we could use machine learning or pattern recognition, then we would be able to decode that uh, information and then drive the device. So I'm just going to show you, uh, like, um, so this is the same patient you saw uh, at the beginning of the talk. He has a, both arm was, uh, was amputated, and he could control the wrist, the hand, in, including an uh, individual finger by picking up the signal on the chest, which is re-innervated. So again, this re-innervation basically giving us a portal to assess the neural signal, okay, through the muscle, and then allow us to decode the person's intent and to drive the device. All right, yeah? So how many, how many nerves do they pick up to actually rewire to the chest? So four. So, right, so there's a four uh, nerve came out from the spinal cord that will go like major one. And then once they go through the arm, they will uh, split, right, so to the individual muscle. But when the amputation uh, is done, then those just a four, muscle, a four nerves is there. So we have to, so they have to identify which muscle, uh, which nerve is which, and then rewire. So basically surgical suture that into the, the chest muscle, okay. And that's enough to, to actually, um to refine all the movements and the fingers and everything? So actually what they con the pattern recognition is a recognize the grasping pattern rather than individual finger. Because, you know, when we use the hand, we, we basically using as a fun coordinated movement. So that's how it's done. So uh, when I work with this patient, uh, we have, so we can clearly classify three class, three type of grasping pattern, like, you know, power grip, maybe, a, a, you know, fun pinch, uh, so, but if over that, we have a difficulty. So, but the, the major joints like the elbow and the wrist, uh, it's much better. Okay. All right, so, and then in my lab, I also work uh, with, you know, for people who have uh, just the hand amputation, and then trying to evaluate uh, this called a pattern recognition, the machine learning approach, and then, uh, before I, I uh, go over the video, I want to uh, show you is say the pattern recognition, the data-driven approach has its limitation. So you have to train the machine, right? So recently you all saw the news that, you know, uh, if you give a lot of sample size, a uh, lot of things that uh, giving to machine, they're gonna 
learn somehow. Well, it's still uh, quite a challenging, but you know, they can learn and then they can find a rule. But if your learning sample does not include a specific situation, then the machine cannot learn, right? So pattern recognition requires you give a learning data. The problem is when, they, when the machine learns, let's say, you know, when I use my hand this way, versus when I concentrate on to grasp, where I change my posture to do this, the muscle signal is actually not the same because the dynamic is not, you know, it's not the, the same, same way. So this video just show you if we ask this patient to, you know, just the driving the joint, individual joint, they work pretty well. But once you say, hey, can you t finish a task? Basically, he's uh, using the spoon to get a, a, a bin. He has a very difficult time. I don't know. So this is just asking him to test like a rotations, hand open, close. It works well. And then once it's put in a, in a context, uh, so one is you notice the posture goes to the, the other side. Um, and also this is kind of like coordinated movement. So basically it means that he needs to actually train more to learn how to, to disassociate the coordinated movement into an individual joint motion. And he has a really hard time. Okay. So uh, currently we are working on another concept because, you know, this data driven, it depends on how you train. Uh, and then the entire process, the, the, I mean the data training is the data driven approach ignore, uh, oh, I'm using a uh, auto slides from uh, Dustin. So, <laughs> so yeah, this, so, so basically the idea is to say the data driven, you ignore, completely ignore the biological process how the neural signal, you know, drive the muscle, drive the joint, and then generate a coordinated movement. You ignore those things just based on, you know, block box input outputs, how you map. map. Um, so therefore, what if we can embed this uh, biological process into uh, this decoding algorithm? So for most of the, uh, the amputee we work with, when you ask him, you know, can you, can you feel your arm is still there? Yes, they still feel their arm, although it's missing. And uh, they actually can generate emotions on their own arm. So which means in their brain, there's a still map uh, inside their brain, we call internal model. So that, well, we, think, we don't know exactly where, but you know, this is the internal, uh, there's a motor control, a, pro, uh, uh, a learning motor control and the motor learning theory. So we, in our uh, brain, we have an internal representation of our limb. So it's still there. So if we can rebuild this internal model and consider the, the, the dynamic, uh, you know, the biomechanic of this uh, uh, property inside, then I guess, you know, with a certain theory to support it, we will do better. And then we actually can control not just a single joint each time, we can control uh, a coordinated movement. Uh, it m potentially can also uh, solve the problem for posture because, right, so we, it's considered that that dynamics, external loading. So uh, this idea uh, basically, uh, so the, the leading person is uh, Dr. Uh, Crouch is there and then uh, he has implemented this algorithm, the model uh, decoding, uh, using, uh, you know, on himself and actually it's real time. I'm going to show you how it perform on himself. <laughs> this is an example of uh, the limb model doing fine position control. So it's a control the wrist and the hand, okay? It's a coordinate, it's not a control one at a time. So quite different the from the previous kind of uh, uh, approach, pattern recognition approach. And then the control, it's quite, it's the fine control. You can see that the slow motions, quick motions, all those dynamic, the, the simulation follows pretty good. And uh, later we also try the this is the interesting part. He actually tried his model on this amputee. Can you tell this amputee? Zero one. Try 
looking at the WIMP model with parameters optimized. Let me pause a little bit. So he is actually showing what he wanted to do, actually doing on his missing limb using uh, the intact hand. And that he is using this hand, so basically he's doing an imagined mirror motion, okay? But you can't see because this side, uh, the hand is missing. And, um, and then you can see, um, and then the model actually built based upon Dustin's model. So the parameter is actually customized to him. There definitely has some missing parts. Well, you know, not matching really well, but it's close. That was really interesting. So basically we can say, you know, his internal model is still there and potentially still preserved because he is also, you know, only a year, one year uh, post amputation. So his brain map has, yeah. So what's the input here? The muscle signal, still the residual muscle, yes. Yes. So, so this is a still using muscle to drive. I mean, on the, the professor was simulating. Does he have sensors attached to this muscle? On yes. The this one. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes. Only two degree freedom. So the wrist flexion extension and then the hand open close. All right. So what I feel the future will be the sensory feedback. A lot of you know, this is a purely motor control. So here's the intent of moving and then the device follow. But when the device touch, you know, uh, objects uh, in the environment, the person cannot feel. And then, or, you know, how much force or torque, how the motion uh, is exerted, I, it, it basically feeds it back through the visual. So they, they actually look at their prosthetic hand when they're doing things. They need a visual feedback. So if we can generate a neural feedback, so through the, you know, giving them a natural sensation of touching, that will be huge. So for example, if any amputee so far has no feedback, they rely on visual. If the task like this, okay, so it's basically you making your uh, the ponytail for most of the female understand, right? So you, you just based on the sense of touching the hand rather than you can't see it. So None of the MBT can do it. So this is the, the part I feel uh, can be a very interesting uh, future work uh, that uh, are definitely collaborative uh, research. Uh, and then also what type of sensor, you know, we can generate, what the neural port we can, uh, we can use to giving a natural sensation. Uh, that's a whole bunch of questions. Uh, there's a, several groups trying to solve, um, but yeah. Anyway, so do you have a question for this? Yeah? So Yeah. Yeah. Right. Is there a mapping between the neural signals and the? Uh, yeah. So that's a good question. So there's uh, people using a multimodal neural signal, right? So use EEG together with EMG to drive. Uh, I actually in my lab I also do some EEG work. I think the for upper limb potentially yes. Uh, the problem is the EEG is not very practical, right? It's noisy, uh, you know, very easy to c contaminate it with all kinds of uh, the noise. And also, you know, you have to gel every electrode, so many, and then it, this is a straightforward. I mean, the EMG is a straightforward. So that's the reason for persistence control, uh, at least in the clinic, all EMG based. Okay. Any questions on this area? Okay. Oh, I, I have to be quick. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm going to also discuss a little bit of my work that towards a neural control of artificial lag. Um, so again, actually for people who have amputation, uh, limb amputation, 90% amputation is done in lower limb. So actually upper limb is a small population. And uh, this is the device that I found uh, most used. Well, not this one, um, but these are the passive device, means they don't generate uh, active torque. So they're passive. They are either like a hydraulic valve. They, they do not provide the torque, okay? So in terms of this type of device is uh, uh, mostly used in the clinic, 
uh, and then it's great for, le I mean, it works for level ground walking, but in terms of, like, say, climbing, I wanted to use the power, right? So I need an active bend of my knee. They can't do it. Um, they have to drag their leg. So they basically use the sound leg to go first and then drag the other one. So that's how they, they negotiate with the stairs. And then in the recent 10 years, uh, the mechatronics started to, you know, the, the mechanical design, the, the actuator, the power, uh, battery getting better. So there's a power device became uh, available. So there are two major ones. Uh, one is called the outer knee. This is power knee. The other is uh, MIT uh, our ankle. So now it's called a biome. All right, so this is just showing you uh, in my lab, we also develop our own prototype of a powered uh, knee. This is a power knee. So you can see there's a motor uh, to drive the, and the with the power, the person could negotiate with the stairs, use a step over step like able body intact person can do. Uh, can negotiate with ramps, stairs, which uh, you know previously using their passive device will be difficult. Okay. And all right. So that's so this control is intrinsic. So it's a basically auto control, so automatic. Right. So you're using the the mechanical sensor in the device to drive the the actuator. So there's nothing, there's no communication between the human and the device, except that they physically attach to each other, okay? All right, so the problem is, let's say this person wanted to walk, initially walk on level ground, and then later he wanted to switch to a staircase, and the device have no idea what's in front of the person. So what they're gonna do, is they have to tell, the user have to tell the device, hey, I'm going to step on the stairs, you better change the way you, you, you drive your joints. So the current approach is using a body motion. So he basically using a kind of a rocking motion. There's some product using tapping, like you tap one, two, three, the sensor understand that you're gonna walk on stairs. Uh, and sometimes, you know, the rocking motion was not performed as it's needed, then it doesn't bend, so he has to go back. Uh, it doesn't bend enough, he has to go back and then rock again. Well, what if there's a neural interface that you can identify what the next step will be? Then the transition will be seamless, right? So this has driven me to uh, investigate the neural control of artificial uh, leg. Um, so my work, uh, so this work basically lead by uh, my current previous uh, PhD student, but currently still in my lab, uh, Dr. Fan Zhang. So what we did is say, okay, here is the autonomous control, okay, that can generate the cyclic movement. If you look at how human control the local motion, right? So when you, when you walk, you never thought about your walking. Do you think about how you're gonna bend your knee or ankle all the time? When we walk, we can chat with people, you know, we can drink, we can do a lot of things while we're walking. So, which means a lot of, uh, so the, the engagement from your cortex is, you know, walking is not that much. So a lot of things that can be done in the spinal cord, right? So that can mimic using the auto control because this does not require your intent to drive. But you will pay attention when you see an obstacle. So then your brain gonna gonna adjust your motion and then uh, to to you know not trip on it, right? So and then the same thing for terrain change. So the idea is to say, okay, we wanted to build the neural interface to decode the task, what type of task the person next step will be, and then we let the detail, the driving, the, this cyclic movement, just using the autonomous control. So we don't want it to drive it all the time using the cortex, uh, using the brain. Um, so what we did is um, we actually not only using the muscle signal from the residual muscle, we also, so that you can see, we, ha we embedded the, the EMG sensors on the, uh, in the socket. We also using uh, motions and then the ground reaction force because they also represent the current state of the person. Okay, we use all the information and the fuse them together to predict, so the output of this 
uh, you know, the classifier is what type of task does the person is actually uh, plan to do for the next step. And, okay, so, but this is just a side talk. I thought uh, it's important for you to learn is we actually try to embed the sensor inside of socket. It was quite challenging. Uh, we, of course, we use the commercial electrodes because this socket is kind of a shoe for people, right? So when they walk, so think about if your shoe has a little rock, it will hit it, it will stop and then kick it out. If you put, because they bear their weight on it, it basically it's a shoe to them. If you put some electrodes, they will hate it. They, it's not a comfort. Uh, and then also the suspension, sometimes, you, you know, if it's, if it's air suction based, if you lose the suction, then it, it, it's basically detached from the person. So we had a, actually struggled a little bit. I'm hoping, you know, working with uh, some electrical engineering uh, professors so we can generate a more flexible uh, electrodes that, you know, can generate a comfort, but also make a reliable reading. Um, all right, so we implement the entire thing real time. And uh, this too is just to show you how the person would translate the task seamlessly using our algorithm. So based on the EMG decoding the task, autonomous control of the knee to switch from the terrain seamlessly without a stop. Okay, so. Compared to this rocking motion, um, you know, we feel this is, this is a mobility. This one, yeah, well, it's, it's not a full, but, you know, it, it works. Um, but, you know, imagine in the a, in a airport, uh, in front of the stairs, you always have to do a lot of tricks to, to transit, which is cumbersome. So, um, yep, this is just a quick review of uh, the neural control of the lag. And uh, I see the future will be, again, one is a sensory feedback. Would the sensory feedback be important for walking? I'm not, I think, I think so. I, I thought uh, Tracy's previous work may be related to that, right? So how the sensory feedback will feed that? And the other is most of the, the prosthetic design is all about walking, okay? How about, you know, someone want to play uh, tennis or, right, dancing? How are you going to do that? So this is, you know, for example, play a tennis require voluntary control all the time, right? So estimate your state and estimate the environment and then you make a decision. So it was just not there. The, the, the people wear this type of device, they can't uh, you know, play like intact person can do. So uh, that means we need a better, maybe better interface uh, but I would put as a future, it's a quite challenging. Okay, so do you have a question in this, this, this project? How much is known about the decoding of these signals, though, uh, in, in terms of uh, what, what's coming out of the brain to control the muscle? What, whatever it is that, we're, you know, all these sort of uh, uh, goals of, of amputees and... Uh, For walking? So, well... Uh, okay, so how much we know in terms of like uh, the decoding of the neural signals? Okay, so the, so first, depend on where you pick up a signal. If it's from brain, uh, there are a lot of people working on uh, brain machine interface, start from invasive, right, uh, to all the way to the surface EEG. Uh, I would say the further away from the source, the actual source, people using just a data driven approach black box, input, output, and mapping. That's a pretty much, you know, what happens. But if you say, okay, internally, if you can put the, the sensor inside of the brain, measure single unit actions, you know, there's also theory in the neuroscience showing, you know, how to decoding the arm movement the directions, right? Uh, so, but if you purely based on the neuroscience to do that, it's also very difficult because there's a lot of things that we don't know in detail. And then in terms of muscle, the muscle is because it's a peripheral. People study intact person, how they control their muscle. I mean, how the muscle firing affect their motions. This is uh, done a lot. 
but the amputee is different. They lost their limb. Is their muscle firing still normal? Uh, so one of my posts are trying to, trying to quantify that because nobody quantifies it. Um, so that can be a, a one way to, to look at it because what, once you lost the limb, your brain starts to change. Your brain, you know, brain is a, has a plasticity. You start to, uh, you know, you, you no longer use it. You, you no longer expect that this will be function. Or, so so it's, it's actually changing. So how that affect the movement? And also the muscle also attached to the bone, suppose. But now they are dangling there. So they lose the, their physical meaning as well. So I, I think it's a question that uh, hasn't been well studied uh, in, terms of, in, in terms of amputee uh, patients' population. Okay. Yep. For people lost one leg, I'm wondering whether you can use a healthy leg to flex the signal and then kind of influence the other one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a great question. Actually, uh, the first version of this t type of control done by MIT professor is saying, okay, I want to use the echo control. Echo control means I mimic the other leg, what the, the other leg is doing, then I just map. Uh, I saw that initially I thought this is a great idea until recently I try to let a person walk symmetrically for people with a limb amputation. It was, not, it, it, they can't do it. It's, you assume that, you know, the walking will be symmetrical for amputee. That's not true. That's, that's, and then also you, if you force them uh, to do that way, they will hate it. They, they just, it, so there's so many reasons, right? So one is the, their, their, their suction, their, I mean, the socket connections. It's another joint there, right, change. And then also there's a, they also have to feel secure when they walk. So what's more important for them is safety, uh, uh, less pain. So, so that, that, that's the part that I feel previous, so that's why the echo control. So the first version of a power knee also have an echo control, a me mechanism. They wire another band on the sound lag, but they give up in the second version. I think that's the reason. Just my thoughts. Okay. Any other? All right. So I, well, I don't know if I can go all the way to the last one, but uh, let, let's see how. Uh, so, all right. So I wanted to also mention one of uh, our work now is to generate uh, adaptation. So how, so, so this is a, what a clinic, so let me explain the clinic challenge now. So the people using the power device, there are many parameters. These parameters have to be adjusted for each individual person because, you know, some people are large, some people are small, some people are strong, some people are active, but others is maybe elderly. And then their, their parameter has to be adjusted based on this person, okay? And what it done is all in clinic. Okay, so once it's done, it's fixed. When they go out, you know, to the real world, it's all fixed. So they're gonna live with the same parameter outside of the clinic. So imagine, let's say, you know, suddenly I wear my backpack or I gain my weight. Oh, I need to check just the parameter, you can't. Uh, or, you know, your environment change, right? So in a clinic, perfect uh, the floor. But in the real life, you know, the floor can be bumpy. So can we do the adaptation here? So that's what I'm getting to is that I wanted to make it adaptive. Uh, and, this is, and then in a clinic, people, how they adjust the parameter is manually. So I'm going to show you this is uh, the power knee. And uh, this is a clinician. Uh, and he will adjust the parameter using a kind of a computer app. You can see he has a, hold on. He has a computer app in a computer uh, that, uh, not app, well, software. He has uh, all the parameter to the slides. So, you know, large or small based on the observation. So he say, okay, go, go ahead and walk. And then, oh, oh, okay, so I think I need to adjust the parameter a little bit more. So that's how it's done. It takes time, okay? And then the, if the person does not satisfy, he has to come back again. Uh, you know, there's a clinical, uh, I mean, the healthcare cost is also there. So I look at this problem and thought, this is actually very easy to solve if we use a computer, uh, artificial intelligence or, you know, adaptive control, right? So 
the first idea I had is, well, if a clinician is adjusting manually, I can replace the clinician, this expert, using the computer. So I observe how the persons perform, and I made a decision. And then this decision can purely mimic what exactly a clinician did. Okay, so that's what I did. Um, so we actually built an expert system, translated the rule from an expert into a computer rules. Okay, so that's the entire uh, concept. I don't go details. Um, so here, just showing you how it perform. Okay, so for this one, we made a randomized choose a really bad initial parameters. Okay, uh, and then let uh, actually my uh, so able-bodied person walking on the device, just as you know. So starting with a really bad parameter, you can see the person was not secure about their balance. Uh, the knee uh, kinematics was not desired, okay? And then after it's automatic toning by using the machine, and then later his posture is better, right? More straight up, and then he also the knee kinematics looks more natural. So, um, okay, so, I don't want to go too much detail, but I want to mention one thing is we did a comparison of, uh, you know, machine toning versus uh, human toning. We want to see which one performed better. Actually, they performed the same because it makes sense. We learn from this person. But in terms of a posture control, based on our observation, actually the human expert did better. What does that mean is, so I didn't go detail. What are we are matching? What, what is our, our criteria to, to adjust? Is it based on the knee kinematics? But the posture is related to human. That is not in our objective function. Okay? So that's the, that's the problem. It means the human expert not only look at how the knee perform, but also entire human to, together with the device, how they perform. Right? They have to walk really gracefully. That means symmetrical you know, stability, many other things, which observed through the, the human, but the machine was, we don't know. We, we thought we know, but we, do, we actually didn't use that in the, our cost function. It's not our optimization goal there. So therefore, we're missing something. That's why the human perform better. Okay, so in that sense, right, we needed to find out what is the objective function. How do you say the person walk better? How, right? So when, you, when two person walk, how do you say, oh, this person walk better than that one, that person? What is the criteria? There's a gazillion of ways you can describe, you know, balance, symmetry, metabolic cost, which is hard to measure in real time. We can't do that. Uh, or potentially we can. Uh, but, right, so, so we don't know. So it's important to also ask the motor control and the learning folks, you know, human movement science folks, to say, what do you mean by the person walk better? That will guide me better to define my cost of function. I'm not going through this one, but I, we have uh, done some other approach using the uh, uh, approximate dynamic programming, so purely learning by machine itself, without even include the the you know, any rule of from the prosthetist. Uh, but yeah, so that's uh, some, some work we are currently work, working on. Yep, all right, so I don't know if I have, still have time. Yes, uh, still have time. Okay, all right, so, so I wanted to introduce uh, one more area, which is the safety part uh, for fall prevention. Um, so, so, you know, like when the person walk uh, with amputation, uh, they actually, had a, so I'm, I'm going to show you. This is a one of the experiments I did. And then just, you know, let the person walking in the lab, perfect uh, floor. I won't say perfect, but, you know, pretty flat floor. And he just walked and then doing the experiment where I'm collecting the data. And then when he turned back, suddenly he tripped himself. It's a little bit bump on the ground. He catch himself and then boom, here. So this, Actually, he said, oh, this happens a lot. Um, 
even a little bit. So that's why they say when, when I walk, I have to look at the, the ground. You know, it, a little bit bump may be okay for you, but for amputee, it's a big deal. They have to pay attention. Okay, so this is a kind of external perturbation, right? This is external, they trip or they slip. Okay, and then they potentially also have an internal failure of the device that definitely going to cause a person to fall. Uh, I'm not going to go that, this, uh, the internal one, but I want to show you uh, the idea of generate artificial uh, reflex through you know, so hopefully it could enhance the person uh, to catch themselves uh, without, you know, during the tripping, uh, they can recover from it. So, um, so, so this is just demonstrating the human reflex. So I'm pretty sure when you walk out in the airport, there's like a auto uh, uh, walkway, right? So the, the uh, kind of a treadmill. And then the first step you step on, you react a little bit. This reaction include, you know, the stretch reflex really quick through the spinal cord, a single synapse, okay, we call M1. And then this signal, this, this event also trigger later, this signal gonna go to another feedback loop and working on other part of your body. So this multiple synapse, but it's still in the, in the uh, spinal cord. And uh, there's a, another long loop that is actually going to go to your brain. And then once, let's say, if you trip, you're going to do uh, some, uh, some, some motions, right, intent to, to avoid that. And then you can recover from it. So that's a later. So there's a, a, a multiple layer of the feedback that allow human, us, intact, to deal with perturbation, okay? I still fall on the slipper, uh, uh, you know, snow, but most of the time I can recover my stumbles, okay? So, but for amputee, it's very, very challenging. They would uh, actually, in the clinic, what they learn is how to fall gracefully rather than recover. They actually learn is how I fall without broken my bones, stuff like that. So, since the device is active, it's robots, right? The idea is, can we detect the tripping or you know, external perturbation? And then let the machine to do this reaction, right? Control the knee joints that somehow could assist the person to recover from the stumble. This is actually very challenging. I, so I did this part. I haven't finished this part. This could be a very simple way, let's say, just to strengthen your knee. Okay, so usually when we had a you know, trip, our first thing is to stabilize our joint. So you're gonna contract your muscle hard, all of the muscle. So that's the most easy way you can think about the control. But we haven't really done much on this part. Um, but I wanna just show you um, the detection part. So we had, we did uh, experimentally, we, we experimentally tripped our patients or slippery. We use a, uh, we use actually treadmill um, to um, to either trip them or causing the slip go this way. Trip is going this way, okay. And uh, we collecting the data. We want to see how well and how fast we can detect uh, this event. And um, so, and not only right. So in terms of control, not only I needed to know, boom, here's the event but also how. It's the forward, backward. Then I can decide how I'm going to do the control. So my output not only have detection, but also I also want, needed to know which way, okay? All right, so we did uh, kind of like source selections. We have done a, a very simple detector, actually all the layer detector, very simple, uh, trying to use a different source to understand, you know, how, how can we detect the fast? So it turns out the mechanical sensor is the most fast, I mean, it's fast. And then if we want to generate that very fast M1 type of uh, feedback, we definitely should use the mechanical sensor to just uh, detect and then react really quick. The muscle signal come later. You can see a large muscle contractions, that stiffness of the joints. 
although this is a residual muscle, they are no longer have that, that uh, um, no longer have the joints, but they do have elicit these neural reactions. So this might showing the later feedback, potentially maybe a voluntary. So can we use this signal to generate, you know, coordinate with a person to recover from the stumbles? That's a question that we wanted to work on. Uh, we haven't get into that, but you know, this is a concept. Potentially, uh, you know, it's 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 a quite interesting. And then also, I believe, in order to recover stumble, the human has to play a big role, <laughs> clearly, right? So the machine is just to coordinate the person to 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 finish this task. So maybe require some training as well. So, but just giving you an idea, um, what what do I mean? about the safety part. Um, so I'm interested to further along to say, you know, can I using some control mechanism to dealing with internal and external uh, perturbations, uh, faults. And then I also, uh, so, so one of, and I also interested in extending this concept into other devices like exoskeleton or neural processes. So we just did a one study on the stroke patients the stroke patients who actually, the patients that uh, can walk, they have, so most of them has a hard time. They, they usually trip themselves just like the amputee because one side of the leg is weak. Actually, the other side is also weak. Uh, it's, it, it, although people say it's uh, unimpaired, but actually both sides uh, has a problem. So uh, they trip themselves uh, by just walking on perfect level ground. And we actually can predict this event because the weakness can show ahead of the time. If we can predict the event, we can drive either exoskeleton mechanically, right? So to lift the, the leg, helping them, or use electrical stimulation to stimulate the muscle, let them to clear the, from the floor. So that's another way we can look at it. It's depend on the, the population. We, we potentially using a, not a very fancy algorithm, but we could do, uh, we could be able to predict or detect the event that actually generate uh, perturbation to the person's balance. Okay, oh, that's it. Uh, and then, uh, so you have seen a couple of uh, projects from, uh, you know, I put a picture there. And then I also have a couple of, uh, you know, the, the undergrad student that work with me uh, on, uh, all kinds of things, development or, or study, so uh, they're terrific. They actually made uh, all those uh, projects happen. I actually just uh, advising them. If you ask me detail, I may say I have to go back and ask my student or postdoc. Um, but anyway, thank you for your attention, and then I also want to thank my collaborators and then uh, my funding source. Thank you. Yeah, right in there. The last uh, things you were showing, uh -huh. can they be extended, not just for empathy, but even if a normal person can attach a device on uh, a person which would prevent the falling if you have an update that what happens to the regular muscle or something? Yeah, so, so the, the stroke uh, study we show is actually we intended to use that for FES, the functional electrical stimulation, so that they have a device uh, they will they will stimulate a certain nerve to cause the muscle to contract and then you know like a dorsi generate like a dorsi uh, flexion of the ankle. Uh, w our thought is to say current device is that they gonna active every gait cycle. They gonna active, and then the electrical stimulation actually will cause the muscle fatigue quickly. Um, you know that that's just the the electrical. Uh, uh, physiology uh, part that it has a, you know. So we, we were thinking, okay, what if we don't active all the time? One, save battery, right? Two is we don't elicit this muscle fatigue effect. If we can predict potentially this person gonna trip himself, we're gonna active. So, so basically the concept is only active when it's needed. Uh, so, so that's one, one work we are trying to do, and potentially we can do a multiple muscle uh, uh, stimulation. And another project I'm 
hoping to get it quickly done is the exoskeleton. So we can stabilize, stabilize the hip. So for example, the, the device uh, can be wear by either, you know, people has a neurological uh, disorder or maybe aging folks that are just very simple, not a lot of torque needed to generate, just a simple brace on the hip. And then when, you know, you see there's a potential the person gonna need assist, you're gonna drive this hip to stabilize uh, the, the, the stability to prevent the fall. So that's the whole idea. Hasn't the pursued further yet. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So there's a people also thinking about just where uh, powered hip exoskeleton, but with a passive device, uh, persists might be might be good enough. Uh, so yeah, there's a, there's a lot of uh, research interest uh, so f uh, now about this 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 part. Any other questions? I have another question. Uh, from what you were saying earlier, uh, then would it be correct to say then that the farther away from, for instance, the action point, namely, for instance, let's say the the, the arm or something, you are the the harder it is when you were saying, for instance, if if you try to to do to achieve the same thing that you were do, achieving by using the muscles, mm -hmm. but r rather now do it completely uh, through the neural uh, uh, signals. Yeah. Would would it be then correct to say that it's harder? Muscle is easier. So right. So so more peripheral, the better. So is it because they do not and we do not understand yet how to decode the signals, or is it because there's maybe the channel is too long for noisiness, or what? what, what so the, uh, yes, first signal is too small for neural signal. Okay, the magnitude is uh, very small, like a uh, millivolt one, and uh, so neural spike, and then two the organization. So if you think about the brain. Brain is essential for whole body everywhere. And then let's say you want to decode the arm. In the brain, this is just this little bit, okay? So you're gonna put, push your pins uh, into this region to record a neuron there. Well, if it's a peripheral nerve, it's even worse. It's like bundle of kind of like a cable, okay? This cable is actually bidirectional. So some is going out, some is coming in. And you're going to tackle each individual axon and then recording that action potential. So far, uh, there's uh, some research, but was, most of them is just purely use of stimulation, giving the sensory feedback rather than decoding it. But muscle, muscle, right, distribute as long as it's available. So amputee, the problem is they may not have that muscle. Uh, so as long as it's available, and the magnitude is much better. The signal to noise ratio is much better. So that's why I usually tell people who tackle the, the brain machine interface for MPT, I would say one is I think the translation of that into clinic will be very difficult, right? You imagine MPT who beyond a loss of limb, other parts is fine. Who will open the skull to implant the electrodes? Almost none, right? So, so they, but, but putting a surface electrodes on the muscle, maybe an invasive electrodes in the muscle, they would accept, but open the skull to put the electrodes in the in the brain. It's it just for this population doesn't make too much sense. Yes. As time goes on, does the EMG sensor become more the um, someone who lost a limb, say, um, does it deteriorate? Find the muscle signal. Yeah. Uh, so the muscle signal, if they use it a lot every day. It doesn't. But if they no longer use it, yes. The muscle will do the, uh, a trophy, so like, because you don't, you don't use it anymore. So usually the residual limb became smaller because the muscle uh, a trophy. And yeah. even after that, they those That's what we believe, yes. If we, you know, hook, hook up those muscle signal became, became meaningful. Again, let's say contract this muscle means I can grab things. Then I believe they will come back again, right? So the, so yes. Right. If there are no more questions, let's thank our speaker again. All right. Thank you.